Welcome. The United Nations reports that there were more than 16 million refugees worldwide last year. This year, it may be more. North Africans might come to mind first. Families in small boats escaping violence and poverty, risking the trip across the Mediterranean in hopes of getting to Europe. But lesser known is a parallel story in Southeast Asia, the Rohingya people, Muslims in western Burma, a persecuted minority hoping to escape to friendlier ground in Malaysia. Their story in a moment. Also on the program today, broken windows policing. Opponents have gathered more than 100 very personal stories that the NYPD is not going to like. Then, did you know Santa Clara County, California, home to high-tech Silicon Valley, has the highest percentage of homeless people in the country? It does, and in looking for solutions, they've come up with lessons that might be applicable here. And towards the end of the hour, how academia could help the financial industry earn back our trust. First, that refugee crisis in Southeast Asia. Let's look at a map of the region. Many of those fleeing largely Buddhist Burma, also known as Myanmar, are from a Muslim ethnic population known as the Rohingya. They are considered outsiders in Western Burma, stateless, non-citizens, forced to live in squalid conditions. Many are trying to flee south and east by boat toward Thailand and Malaysia. There have been many drownings and exploitation by smugglers. This story is as complicated as it is tragic. To explain the Rohingya refugee crisis, we turn to Simon Billinis, executive director of the U.S. Campaign for Burma, who joins us via Skype from Washington, D.C. Hello from New York. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. How many Rohingya are there? Well, there's just over a million uh, Rohingya uh, in Burma. And there are hundreds of thousands who've been forced into uh, internment camps after being uh, forced out of their homes by the, uh, the military regime. They're residents of Burma, but they're considered stateless. I don't, explain, I don't get it. Explain. Well, many Rohingya have lived in Burma for generations. In fact, uh, many lived in Burma since uh, before the uh, country got its independence from Britain in the 40s. And uh, they're uh, without citizenship and without uh, uh, a state because the, the Burmese regime has taken away their citizenship and taken away their identification papers. What is the Burmese regime, or I guess they call it the Myanmar regime these days, have against the Rohingya? Well, you know, typically um, the military regime, which has basically ruled Burma since 1962, They've typically used prejudice against the Rohingya, prejudice against Muslims generally, to try and get some semblance of popular support. And you know what we've seen is um, the regime has you know encouraged and stoked and used prejudice against the Rohingya as a way of you know generating some kind of support in advance of elections that are due to come in November of this year. And I gather that 2012 was a key year. What happened in 2012? 2012 was when um, the U.S. and Europe dropped uh, most of their economic sanctions that they had on Burma after promises of reform and some limited reforms from the then Burmese president, Then Sein. You know, since then, we've seen a lot of backtracking by the Burmese regime around restoring democracy and respect for human rights. And a big part of that has been uh, the regime's campaign of persecution and ethnic cleansing against the Rohingya. The minority population there is Buddhist Rohingya, I mean is uh, Muslim Rohingya. The majority population in Myanmar is Buddhist, correct? That's correct. That's correct. But there's a number, a uh, sizable number of both of Muslim, Christian and also animists. Um, it goes against our basic idea of who Buddhists are, peace-loving people who worship the Buddha. Is this kind of an aggressive Buddhist nationalism that exists in that country that just doesn't come to our attention very much? Well, it's definitely an extreme and aggressive form of nationalism and xenophobia among the majority Burman population which has clothed itself in Buddhism as a way of you know, gaining legitimacy in the same way that you know, right-wing extremists 
clothe themselves in Christian, uh, you know, morality, uh, you know, here in the U.S. It's uh, it's not really a Buddhist phenomenon. It's really a nationalist and xenophobic group. So no need for Charlie Hebdo to draw some Buddha cartoons. Um, no, no, not for that. No. Who is going to see and in what numbers and what's been happening to them? Well, a number of uh, Rohingya have been, uh, you know, escaping and fleeing Burma. You know, a number of them have been, you know, trafficked by uh, human traffickers who've, you know, levied exorbitant fees to uh, get them on boats and out of the country. Right now, we uh, estimate there are a couple of thousand still stranded at sea. Uh, in the Andaman Sea. And, you know, we've been pushing the U.S. government uh, and other governments in the region to take leadership to locate and rescue those currently stranded at the ocean. Why do they go to Thailand and Malaysia? Are there fellow uh, Muslim populations there? Well, certainly uh, in both Malaysia and Indonesia, uh, these are majority Muslim countries. Uh, Malaysia and Indonesia have taken in uh, a number of these Rohingya refugees. Um, Thailand is not so friendly, and uh, Thailand has had to be pushed uh, by the U.S. not to uh, push the refugees back into the sea. Are you asking the U.S. to do something or resume doing something that it had been doing? I mean, right now, the, uh, the U.S. Uh, you know, has in the past taken at least uh, 1,000 Rohingya uh, into the U.S., and we're looking for the U.S. to show some leadership, not just in the, the search and rescue, but also uh, in the resettlement of those Rohingya who fled the country. Um, one of the world's living Nobel Peace Prize winners is in the parliament in Burma or Myanmar. Myanmar. That's the opposition leader, Aung San Suu Kyi. Where does she fit into this? Well, she's, you know, avoided the subject. Um, for whatever reason. And, um, you know, I think the important thing to realize is that, you know, Aung San Suu Kyi, you know, entered politics uh, in 2012, um, ran for parliament, was elected to parliament. And, you know, now, you know, for us uh, as an advocacy group, you know, she's another politician who we should hold to account just like any other. And, you know, we think uh, she should speak out um, on this issue, uh, but she's... Uh, definitely shied away as of late. But I gather the Dalai Lama, sort of on behalf of the world's Buddhists, is pushing on San Suu Kyi to take a stronger position and a, play a more positive role as, I guess, also one Nobel Peace Prize winner to another. Yeah, and that certainly um, you know, speaks to the credit of the Dalai Lama, and I think also demonstrates that um, the uh, sort of nationalistic and extreme xenophobic group in Burma that, you know, clothes itself uh, in Buddhist robes isn't really representative of Buddhism as a whole. Is it dangerous for dissident Buddhists, let's say, who might have some sympathy for the Rohingya or just sympathy for human rights in general uh, to speak out? Is it dangerous to protest the majority position? Yes, it is. I mean, for instance, a member of Aung San Suu Kyi's party, Tin Lin U, was just this week sentenced to two years hard labor. And the reason for that was he spoke out uh, against uh, uh, these extremist groups. He said they, they were not representative of Buddhism. And for that, the regime charged him with defaming religion, and he's now been put in prison for two years. How does the government stir up hatred of the Rohingya? Are there certain stereotypes that they play on? I mean, certainly, I mean, they play on a lot of the stereotypes of Muslims that uh, you would uh, uh, see, you know, in any part of the world. Also, um, you uh, see a lot of, you know, prejudice against the Rohingya um, as, uh, uh, you know, cited as immigrants to Burma, when really these are people who've lived in Burma, most of them, for uh, generations. Um, tell us about your group. It's been around for a long time. Is this the main focus of your work, or does it fit into a larger set of issues about Burma? I mean, this is a particularly urgent issue right now, but it fits into our larger agenda of supporting democracy, 
human rights and social justice in Burma. So right now we're, uh, we're pushing uh, the regime and pushing the US government to push the regime to make sure that the elections in November are fully free and fair. And we've also um, uh, spoken out in support of, of other ethnic minorities in Burma who are currently uh, under attack by the Burmese army. Are the elections this fall going to be free and fair? Right now, uh, the, the signs are not good. Uh, you know, over a million people have been disenfranchised. Uh, Aung San Suu Kyi is not allowed under the constitution to run for president. Um, there have also been crackdowns on freedom of the press, imprisonment of journalists, imprisonment of protesters. Um, it's not looking good right now, and that's why we're asking the US government to put more pressure on the Burmese regime to uh, make sure those elections are indeed free and fair. You've got me worried about all these people floating out at sea. What if there's a big storm? How many people are out there at any one time? I mean, right now, um, it's a couple of thousand. Um, you know, it could be more as uh, the regime essentially, you know, makes life so intolerable for the Rohingya that they see no alternative than to uh, flee by sea. Who rescues them? Who's playing a role there? Is there a role for the U.S. Navy or anything like that? I mean, right now, um, U.S. aircraft have been deployed to help locate. Uh, and they've also been working with the Malaysian Navy and uh, other countries' navies to uh, pick up those at sea and bring them to safety. And just tell our viewers, who've probably heard the media say for many years now, Burma, also known as Myanmar, or Burma, whose name was changed to Myanmar by the dictatorship in power there. Uh, explain the difference. Why, why the two names? What do they signify? Who gets what by using Myanmar over Burma? Well, really, um, both, uh, both names, both Burma and Myanmar, have the same linguistic root uh, in, uh, in the Burmese language. Uh, it's just that the military regime decided to rename the country Myanmar, and so uh, the democracy movement stuck with the name Burma, and that was uh, you know, one way in which you could tell whose side people were on. Well, for the many viewers who didn't know about this crisis, thanks for giving us something else to worry about. Thank you for your time. This past Saturday, activists from PROP, the Police Reform Organizing Project, were out in Tompkins Square Park and other locations to gather support and distribute their new report entitled that's how they get you, New Yorkers encounters with broken windows policing. Also known as quality of life policing, the method championed by Commissioner William Bratton maintains that preventing small crimes creates an atmosphere of lawlessness, thereby preventing more serious crimes. The prop report isn't a new analysis of broken windows. Rather, it tells the very personal stories of more than 100 citizens' experiences when targeted for minor infractions like public drinking or riding a bike on the sidewalk. Joining us, Robert Ganji, founder and director of PROP, the Police Reform Organizing Project. Welcome back. Thank you, Brian. Um, why tell people stories rather than issue a traditional report with charts and graphs and right, statistics? Right. Well, we've done that. <laughs> And we put out reports that focus on statistics and numbers, and we put out reports, sort of almost policy wonky reports, that make very specific recommendations about the reforms that the, the de Blasio administration should adopt to make policing more just and more effective. And we thought it was very important, in addition to uh, doing that kind of public education work, to tell the stories of the individuals who encounter quota-driven broken windows policing to give the broader public some idea of how not only racially discriminatory arrest practices are in New York City, but how in some instances they're almost surreal and it's not quite believable that the police are actually spending the time and the resources to, to ticket people and arrest people for these infractions. And, to, and they're not crimes. So that's not like when you say broken windows means you focus on lesser crimes so in order to uh, prevent um, or reduce the incidence of more serious crime. These are infractions. They're um, called violations sometimes. Riding a bike on a sidewalk is not a crime. Begging is not a crime. 
uh, putting your feet up on a subway seat is not a crime. But the police do ticket people and arrest people for those activities, and it's almost always people of color. So you've got 117 stories. Pick one of what you just called a surreal story mm -hmm. and tell us, any one. Uh, the one was uh, the cops arrested a young woman at 2.30 in the morning at the Canal Street subway station because she had her foot up on a subway seat. Uh, and the, a young woman with no criminal record and her, her and she had her identification on her. Um, another story where a man grew up in a project in the Bronx. He uh, moved away. He returned to the project. He was hanging out with friends and relatives. He had the tattoo. He had tattooed on his arm the address of the housing project, and the cops arrested him for trespass, despite people saying that he belonged here and we welcome him here. And the, the case was eventually dismissed after repeated appearances uh, uh, before, this was in the Bronx, before the, a, a Bronx court. Another case um, where uh, two Latino men were arrested on the charge of manspreading. Um, uh, the, and they were Man arrested. spreading, well, you want to stop for a second and define yeah. that for people who don't know what it is? Well, um, it's what I understand it to be where a man sits in a seat or here on a subway seat having his, instead of legs crossed or close together, spread out and therefore potentially inconveniencing other passengers. In surveys of subway pet peeves, this always ranks very high. Guys who sit like this and kind of take up a couple of seats, right, basically. Right. The, but the issue here was, and the judge said it uh, in the courtroom, 12:11 uh, a.m., meaning the arrest took place 11 minutes after midnight. I doubt that many people were on the subway at that time, meaning she didn't believe the validity of the charge that the cops had engaged in, in effect, a bogus arrest. And what our um, our findings before we issued this report, but certainly documented in this report, show that cops, under the pressure of the quota system will engage in, in frivolous arrest, uh, sometimes false arrest, and uh, sometimes where they, mis they misrepresent or lie about what actually happened. We think it's the pressure of the quota system because if cops don't hit their numbers in a given month, they will get a poor job evaluation. I'll come back to the quota system charge in sure. a minute. But on something like the man spreading, mm -hmm. and this might also apply to other minor infractions that result in arrest. Right. The cop probably looks at their computer, at their handheld, and discovers that there's an outstanding warrant right. for in the, the individual. In, in these right? two cases, there was outstanding warrant, one for park after dark and one for public urination. Uh, and the NYPD, for better or worse, we think for worse, has a policy, if you're stopped for some low-level infraction and the cop runs a check on you, finds that you have an outstanding warrant, even if that was many years ago, and for another low-level infraction, the cop has to arrest you. And being arrested can be a traumatic experience for people. You're, you're put in handcuffs and you're confined, generally speaking, for anywhere from 18 to uh, 35, 40 hours before you see your judge. And what else happens to people? You're concerned about this because even though they may be short-term arrests mm -hmm. for minor things, there are potentially long-term effects on right. their lives, right? Right, absolutely. Uh, one case uh, we heard about from an attorney in Brooklyn, uh, his client got deported and he had two uh, open alcohol container. Uh, one summons, then an arrest for it because he hadn't cleared up the first, uh, uh, the warrant for the, for the first stop. Um, people can, the parental custody can be challenged. People can lose access to scholarship. People can lose uh, job opportunities. And one case that we reported uh, it happened to a man who had no criminal record, worked for the Transit Authority, and, he, and the case was eventually dismissed, but he lost five months of work time. Uh, in the, but the, the main impact of these practices, um, and I'm going to use a cliche, I can't emphasize this point enough, is that they're blatantly racist. 85 to 90 percent of these punitive interactions take place between the NYPD and people of color. We were in Manhattan Arraignment Park uh, last Friday, May 29th, where we were observing uh, arraignment proceedings 
taking a look basically at who the cops are arresting and what they're charging them with. And a number of the stories in our report came from that kind of court monitoring work. 30 out of 31 of the people who were arraigned were African American or Latino. The one white man, middle aged white man, history of drug addiction, he had fallen off the wagon and he got arrested for drug possession charge. Uh, and so much of our police resources are, because of broken windows, because of the quota, are focused on these kind of arrests and these kind of summonses. Could it be that that's who's committing these violations? We do know that there are districts, precincts, neighborhoods where the vast majority of the violent crimes take place. And, you know, if seeing it as a result of uh, poverty, association with low income mm -hmm. and, and, you know, impoverished uh, conditions, right. those are minority neighborhoods. Right. Now, we, we have no problem with the police concentrating on areas where there's a high level of crime if they're concentrating on crime. When you arrest people for bike on a sidewalk, for open alcohol container, and, and you're not arresting people who are engaged in criminal activity or anything that approaches criminal activity, but you are, in effect, criminalizing people. And the other point, I'm going to use the cliche again. In other words, I can't if they find somebody with an open container of alcohol right. on Park Avenue and 70th That Street, person will not get arrested. Right. They may get shooed away or something or like that. Or probably not even that. There's one story a, a, a retired police officer told us, a black man. He was transferred from uptown in Harlem to work in the Central Park precinct. One of his first days out there, he started giving a ticket to a white couple that was drinking wine or champagne in the park. Uh, and the white man was stunned because he had been doing that for years and nobody ever challenged him. Uh, so there's a uh, fuss, crowd gathers, the officer supervisor shows up and says, what are you doing? Uh, the black officer says, well, I was uptown and if there was a young black man drinking a beer on the stoop, I was supposed to either ticket him or arrest him. These people are breaking the law. And I'm writing him up and the supervisor told him, close your summons book, leave the scene, and a couple of days after he was transferred. So the, uh, it is undeniable that the kind of things that people of color get arrested for and ticket for in New York City, for the most part, have been decriminalized in white communities. You know that we're having this conversation on the same week that the main story about policing and actual crime in New mm -hmm. York City, that's kind of the number one local story in the city right now, I think, is the 20% increase in murders compared to this time last year mm -hmm. and strong uptick in shootings. And there's a contingent, at least, that says the police have bring pulled back, back, back too much. You <laughs> saw that on the cover of yeah, Post, right, of the Post, right, right. bring right. back, stop, and frisk. Well, there's, there's a, a couple of things that are misguided about this kind of reporting. One is, and, and the, uh, the mainstream press does this regularly, whenever there is some issue related to crime, like now an uptick in crime, or suppose there was a sharp decline in crime, they go to the police department, as if the police department and policing strategies is the only public policy or practice that relates to the commission of crime or the drop in crime. And there's so many factors, social and economic factors, that go into an uptick in, in the, the use of guns or in murders. The other thing, the other important point to make is the, what the press is reporting is an uptick for the first four or five months of this year compared to last year. But if you compare the, the number of homicides and the gun violence to say 2011, which was four years ago, which was the heyday of stop and frisk, the police made over 685,000 stops, the numbers for this year are still below that. Um, so we realize that there's the chance of a kind of political stampede happening that's going to result in, for example, the support for the city council proposal to add a thousand cops. Our point is when you have so many of your police officers who engage in kind of practices that we uh, report on in effect in uh, that's how they get you, um, you can't justify a thousand more cops when you, what you should be doing is redeploying the cops who are now engaged in uh, these frivolous, uh, bogus types of activities that are targeting people of color. And the, the antagonism and the distrust in uh, the black and Latino communities, particularly among young people toward police officers, is extraordinary. And it's deep-seated. Um, 
And so what are the police practices that you want changed? You have a list. Right. The very specifically uh, the quota system. Um, right now, the way the quota system operates is cops only get credit for punitive interactions. Uh, one police officer once said to me, and I thought it was a very instructive comment, if I, he was one of the few officers speaking out against the quota system. So he said to me, if I uh, uh, break up a fight between two boys and send them home, I don't get any credit. If I happen to help deliver a baby in emergency, I don't get any credit. I will get high marks. I will get positive marks if I make a stop or give out a seatbelt ticket. Now, that turns the idea that most people have of good policing on its head. Although Bratton says, without mentioning Ray Kelly by name, right. that there was a quota system right. under Bloomberg Kelly right. and that he's done away with it. It's that just, this broken windows policing is a response to calls that they get. They, I mean... I've met Bratton a couple of times, and I like him personally and socially, but he is misrepresenting what actually goes on in the street, and he's being at best disingenuous. The, what other rationale is there for a police officer to accuse somebody of manspreading at 11 minutes after midnight, to arrest a young woman for putting a foot up on the subway seat, not even giving her a ticket, not even giving her a warning and say, hey, why don't you put your foot down? The only rationale can be that there's a quota system. And we have talked to several police officers who have said, yeah, there's a quota system. And some police officers, particularly officers that we spoke to who are officers of color, are not happy with it. But they know that they have to abide by it for them to be a viable person within the police department. One, one um, cop who was kind of defending the quota system to me one day said, it's an informal quota system, right. but if you look at a police officer out on the job, there's enough stuff going on that they're, if they're not giving some speeding tickets, some stopping people from, for this or that, then they're actually not doing their job. Right. But our view is, is and not just our view, is that the police shouldn't be defined as doing their job if they're sanctioning people, if they're um, basically... Um, interfering with people going about their daily lives. One of the points we wanted to make in the report is for most of these vignettes, these are people who are just going about their lives, you know, having a backpack on the subway seat next to them, walking between a subway car, riding a bike on the sidewalk. These are not people with any criminal intent, but they're being treated as criminals by NYPD practice. Can people read these 117 stories online somewhere? Yes. Oh, yes. The, uh, it's on, it'll be available on the PROP website, policereformorganizingproject.org. To get to your point, we, we are also that's advocating... With all those words spelled out? Is yes, that the, right. That's Police the web address? Reform, right, right. Policereformorganizingproject.org. Project and we're also promoting the abandonment of broken windows policing. The police officers on their own, <laughs> in effect, applied experiment when they did their work stoppage at the end of December and early January. Arrests declined by 66 percent. Summonses declined by 90 percent in the city for that three-week period. Crime by the police department's own reporting went down. Um, and the city... There was uh, also Christmas week. There, there's another side of this argument. Yeah, but it says three, it was Christmas week. It was three freezing weeks. cold outside. Yeah. And the final week, it went back up. Uh, not the final week of December. It started, oh, the final it, week of the work slowdown. Right, right, right. But 90% drop in summonses, 60% drop in arrests, no report of a cop ignoring any serious criminal incident. And... Um, a, a very revelatory part of this was a newspaper or magazine article where a young black man said, oh, so this is what it, like, this is what it feels like to be a white person in New York City. Um, and we know that that's the case, that these practices are racially discriminatory, and simply on a moral basis, they should be rejected. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Brian. Time for Public Intellectual, where we look at new research with the power to change minds and public policy. Today, a cost-effective method of housing the homeless. 
The population of New York City shelters surpassed a record 60,000 this year, and it's rising. But the study comes, of all places, from Santa Clara County, California, home to Silicon Valley. Turns out that high-income county has the highest percentage of homelessness in all of America. This according to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Now a new report, said to be the largest study of U.S. homelessness ever, concludes that the key to housing the homeless without breaking the bank is to focus on providing homes to the long-term homeless. To explain, Dr. Daniel Fleming, president of the Economic Roundtable, the research group that put together the report. He joins us on Skype from the Sierra Mountains in California. Welcome to our program. Hello from New York. Thank you very much, Brian. It's good to be with you. What research question were you trying to answer with your study? Well, we were trying to understand the makeup of the homeless population and the movement of people in and out of homelessness and the cost structure among folks who experienced homelessness. And uh, <clears throat> a couple of the key findings were there's sort of a hockey shape, hockey stick, a shape profile to the duration of homelessness. So, And I'm going to interrupt because we have that graph. We're going to put that chart up right now. Okay. And you can help interpret for our viewers um, what they're seeing here on on this graph. And as you say, hockey stick, it starts high and to the left and comes down along the bottom. What are these axes? So the the vertical axis is the percent of this population of 104,000 people who experienced homelessness over this six-year period that we studied. <clears throat> and what we're seeing is that most folks had relatively uh, short stints of homelessness and made it out by finding a job or help from family or help from friends. So number of months homeless is going across the bottom. And since exactly. the spike in the chart is at the beginning, large numbers of people who are homeless are homeless for short periods of time, and then there's the much smaller number of people who are homeless for a very long time. That's the point of this graph, right? That's exactly the point of it, right. And this graph leads to kind of a complementary uh, mirror graph. The, the distribution of public costs for people who experience homelessness is very highly concentrated among people who have these long stints of homelessness. So the, and we can see that in this bar graph, this, this much more colorful, colorful graph with the six lines? So these are, this, is, this is a stacked graph uh, showing <clears throat> cost percentiles. So the top, the top of the bars, the top uh, end of the light blue segment of the bars is the average cost for the most expensive 5% of, of homeless folks. And the purple stack underneath it is the next 5%, and then beneath that, the next 30%. I see. So, so that down. most expensive 5% of homeless people are costing about $80,000. Is that per year? Yes, that's per year. And so, right, the mirror image of, of the other chart, when you take them together, so just 5% of homeless people may be homeless for a very long time, but that 5% is costing a large percentage of the dollars spent on homelessness services, Almost correct? Almost half of the public expense. Almost half of the public expense. Right. And why is that? Why does long-term cost more? Is it just that they're homeless for longer? Well, wreckage accumulates as people experience homelessness. Um, wreckage and social connections, um, wreckage and connection to work, wreckage and health, um, wreckage and justice system entanglement. These most expensive individuals are people with recurrent crises in their lives that get addressed in very expensive settings uh, in hospitals and in jails. And it doesn't happen just once. <clears throat> it happens again and again at um, very high public cost and with, uh, without substantial uh, change in the 
life conditions of these individuals. But if your conclusion is as I understand it, which is to spend money on the long-term homeless first to give them housing, doesn't that increase the number of dollars that you're spending on that population right away? Costs for these individuals go down about 68% when they are stabilized in housing with supportive services. So um, if they're housed, they're not in jail. If they're housed with supportive services, they get preventive health care rather than going into emergency rooms and being hospital inpatients. So <clears throat> being stabilized and not being in a, a stressful, unreliable, threatening environment uh, when they're unsheltered and getting regular care really brings down costs. Is this group of folks even likely to stay in that housing? Because one of the things that I've heard is um, even at very low cost, or maybe there's no cost, you tell me, because it's probably the most impoverished part of the homeless population too, uh, there'll be a tendency to drift back to the street. Well, this segment of homeless individuals has significant disabilities and often their mental disabilities uh, accompanied by uh, physical health problems and appropriate housing for them includes case managers who stay in touch with them and help them. So good housing support services can achieve about a 90% or better retention rate at the six month mark, um, slightly below 90% at the one year mark. So with good supportive services, you can uh, keep people in housing. Were you able to measure that? Did you, um, was this an actual program to, uh, to address this or is this your conclusion for what might well work based on your study of who is where and how much they cost? We've studied this both in Santa Clara County and in Los Angeles County and looked at pre and post housing outcomes. And so these, these estimates of savings are based on actual post housing cost data. What kind of housing for this most hardcore homeless population with the mental health and other multiple problems? It's typically a small studio apartment so it would be an apartment, either a scattered site housing unit or in a project-based um, supportive housing complex. So sometimes their neighbors are other formerly homeless individuals, and uh, in other instances, they're just uh, members of the public. That scatter be, site is take uh, a, any kind of low-income housing and put it uh, in a non-concentrated way in the general community, more integrated. Do you, and this is such a big debate in American cities for all kinds of subsidized housing. Do you find that scatter site uh, works better than um, the concentrated project to reduce poverty or reduce homelessness? Well, one of the main uh, requirements is that the landlord has some empathy with the, with the tenants and that there are good supportive services to solve problems, but it can work very well in a scattered site setting with um, um, a landlord who is open to individuals with disabilities and good supportive services for those individuals. Why did the, you study this in Santa Clara County, the heart of um, you know, what we here in the East think of as high-tech, high-income Silicon Valley? Well, it is high income. Uh, I'm told that Silicon Valley has the highest uh, gross domestic product per capita in the world. So there is a great deal of wealth in Silicon Valley. Um, it's also a place with a significant amount of poverty and extremely expensive housing. And uh, so that combination has left a segment of the population homeless. And there's growing concern in the county about doing something about this. So we were commissioned to come in and study it. And the next step is we're, we're developing screening tools based on the data from the study to identify 
these very high need individuals with the goal of placing 3,000 of them in housing in the near future. So you get to apply your findings to help people, that's great. What's the bottom line takeaway before you go of your research? Well, the bottom line takeaway is that the, uh, the population experiencing homelessness is not monolithic. There are different needs and different appropriate solutions for different groups within the population. And that when we understand those needs, we can tailor responses that allocate scarce resources like highly subsidized housing most effectively and have other resources that are um, less cost intensive made available to other folks in the population. Well, thank you for joining us and good luck. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Up next, the financial industry, how academia can help it earn back our trust. Just last month, six of the world's top banks were fined nearly $6 billion for their involvement in the coordinated manipulation of foreign currency exchange markets and of LIBOR, a benchmark used globally to calculate mortgage rates. If you ain't cheating, you ain't trying, said one Barclays Bank employee. The settlement comes eight years after the financial and subprime mortgage meltdowns of 2007 and 2008, and skepticism of the field of finance has been running high ever since. But with an important exception, according to our next guest, the many scandals of finance have not awoken academia to the industry's significant shortcomings. University of Chicago finance professor Luigi Zingales would like his fellow researchers and educators to ask themselves, how does finance benefit society and begin to restore trust in the financial system? Professor, welcome. Hello from New York. Thank you for having me. As an economist, what is the role of the financial industry ideally in society? So the primary function of the financial industry is to match talent with money. If uh, everybody with talent were, was born rich, finance would not have a lot to do. In reality, talents and opportunities arise everywhere, and the function of the financial industry is to channel the money where the action is. Do you think that the finance industry has gone downhill, and for how long in terms of meeting its ideals? I think that uh, the financial industry has uh, done a lot to uh, accomplish those tasks, but uh, number one, can do much more. And number two, we, we have uh, at least a part of the financial industry that is more interested in uh, what we economists call rent-seek, so find opportunity to make money regardless of uh, the contributions to society. When a bank uh, or a venture capitalist land money or invest in a new company, they accomplish two goals. They accomplish the one of giving a return to their investor, but they also accomplish the goal of creating something for society. That is the role finance should play. Uh, unfortunately, uh, lots of times, uh, is just to make money for uh, the investor or the trader, uh, not for society at large. Do you think many people consider that the role of their own investing or in the context of an investment house, their role to create value for society? You use the term rent-seeking, that is just to seek money for their own benefit. But even when the average mom and pop is investing, figuring out where to put their money to save for retirement, aren't they rent-seeking, as you call it? They're not figuring out where is my money going to do social good unless they're in the small minority of people that invest in social investment funds, right? Oh, absolutely not. I think this is the beauty of a well-organized market economy. As Adam Smith has taught us many years ago, uh, we don't need uh, the butcher or the baker to be aiming to social good to create uh, a, a social good. The reason why I enjoy fresh bread and fresh meat every day is not because they care about society at large, but because the system of competition ensures that uh, individual pursuit of private interest delivers the, uh, uh, interest, the, the benefits of everyone. This is what uh, a good working competitive economy is about. And my fear is that in some sectors of the financial industry, 
this is not the case, uh, where there are sort of an excessive amount of uh, a monopoly or oligopoly, where rules are not designed properly, so that those are the situations where the pursuit of private interest deliver not the, the, the uh, common good, but delivers uh, what uh, I just described, the rent-seeking. Rent seeking. Where does academia come in? I think that the role of academia is precisely to separate the wheat from the chaff. Uh, there is a risk uh, of academia to become just uh, uh, the sort of uh, uh, cheerleaders of the finance industry. Uh, one, what we should do is we should uh, uh, particularly uh, expose what is wrong and uh, uh, try to help what uh, actually works or is, is right. Do they teach business ethics? at the University of Chicago or in general in the business schools? Actually, uh, most business schools today have some special courses uh, uh, about business ethics, but uh, I think those uh, uh, special courses are not well intended unless uh, they are mandatory. And when they are mandatory, they are hated by the students uh, who uh, don't really want to participate in them. It reminds me, I grew up in Italy and uh, in high school there was a mandatory hour of religion. And uh, we all became atheists as a result of that hour of religion. So uh, having separate classes of ethics does not really uh, serve uh, the, the right purpose. Uh, what we should do is that when we teach finance, when we teach marketing, when we teach economics, we introduce also a discussion about uh, uh, ethics uh, in the way uh, we conduct business. I think that uh, it should be not be a separate class should be an integral part of our teaching. Why do you think academia has become cheerleaders for the finance industry in too many cases? I mean, theoretically, academia is precisely to be apart from, not a part of, whatever it is that they're studying. That's the nature of dispassionate research, right? Uh, it is the nature of dispassionate research, but uh, it's, uh, I would say, natural to fall in love with what you study. So if you are a nuclear scientist, uh, uh, nuclear physicist, you generally like nuclear power uh, regardless, and you are attracted to uh, complicated uh, uh, plans because that's what you study. And I think that the financial industry, the financial, uh, the um, uh, finance professor in academia tend to all too often to sort of uh, fall prey of uh, the gadgets they develop and they are in awe of the success of these gadgets without thinking uh, to the broader picture. Can you give us some positive examples of markets um, working well these days, that is the finance industry and its interaction with markets working well, innovations that you think have been for the better or practices that are for the good? I think that the venture capital industry is uh, really sort of uh, serving a, a huge uh, uh, role in society by promoting innovation, creating more jobs, and so on and so forth. So I think that that, that is a very positive innovation. Um, crowdfunding that uh, we see is taking uh, place today and is expanding, I think that's uh, uh, a, a very useful uh, uh, contribution. Um, even peer-to-peer -peer lending, something that uh, uh, none will have predicted 10 years ago, seems to be uh, working fairly well. And uh, people uh, seem to be doing uh, lending decision uh, fairly accurately at a very low cost and uh, seems to be sort of uh, a, a fairly successful uh, area of the financial industry. Peer-to-peer -peer lending, how does that work? Is that lending that bypasses the banks altogether? Yes, it is. How so? Who has that much money? Actually, this is the interesting about peer-to-peer -peer lending is uh, you can enter with very little money, but uh, because you aggregate the, the numbers, uh, the overall amount land can be significant. And uh, that's the way it works uh, in companies like the Lending Club, and they tend to be quite successful. And did that come about, or is that on the rise in recent years, because of the collapse of the financial industry or the 
serious problems that it had in 2008 and thereabout? I think it's on the rise for a combination of things. One is uh, the internet made this available. Uh, before the internet, this would be inconceivable. Uh, but also, uh, during the crisis in 2008, uh, banks sort of uh, were very reluctant to lend, and so demand for uh, borrowing uh, spur uh, entrepreneurs to create uh, new instruments, and these instruments turn out to be quite uh, helpful. And examples of things that don't work? Should we go to the things that were so much in the news in 2008 or so, uh, those kinds of, those kinds of uh, insurance schemes and things? Um, I think that, uh, uh, unfortunately, the examples of things that don't work are a lot. First of all, uh, there is a long list uh, of uh, manipulations done by the financial industry. You just started the program mentioning some uh, um, penalties that were imposed to banks because they were, were manipulating some of these indices. Unfortunately, uh, these uh, fines tend to be uh, the rule these days rather than the exception. And so I think that... Uh, uh, that's, that's a sector that clearly uh, does not work. Uh, we have seen banks taking uh, too much risk and uh, counting on the government to bail them out. This is something that doesn't work. Uh, we have seen banks uh, lobby very heavily to have regulation shaped to their needs and not consumer needs. That's another thing that doesn't work. You've said that the healthcare industry is similar to the finance industry. How so? Oh, in many dimensions. First of all, uh, healthcare and sort of uh, uh, financing or, or finance in general are sort of two businesses where most people don't understand much of what is happening, but everybody needs some. Uh, I understand very little about uh, uh, medicine, but I do need medical services. And doctors understand in general very little about finance, but need financial services. And everybody needs doctor services and financial services. So. Uh, is a sector that is plagued by sort of uh, what we call a symmetry of information that the uh, insiders know much more than the outsiders and uh, where there is a lot of regulation, uh, but where the United States uh, uh, seem to be doing not particularly well in terms of the efficiency. Uh, we know healthcare is huge in the United States, but uh, if you look at the um, life expectancy of uh, the uh, average American is not as uh, long as the one of other countries. And uh, um, you might argue that maybe this is due to other things, genetics or food. But in recent years, uh, the United States spent uh, much more in the um, uh, healthcare sectors and they've not seen their life expectancy increase as in other countries. So there is something clearly dysfunctional in the way uh, the uh, healthcare sector works. And uh, I fear there is some of that dysfunctionality also in the financial sector. So in our last two minutes, to bring it back to academia, are the business schools admitting the wrong kinds of students? Should they be admitting people who are maybe less quantitative and more in the humanities and thinking about society and things like that? Um, I don't think that the problem is the quantitative versus uh, uh, humanities. I think that having uh, a, a better training about when uh, a, a free market economy delivers a good outcome and when it doesn't and what it needs to be done when it doesn't, I think that's what we need. And, and part of that training is mathematical. But uh, I think, uh, as I was saying, Earlier, the most important thing is that we discuss with our students that uh, uh, there is a range of behaviors that uh, might be legal but not be ethical or by not be sort of according to business rules and uh, that might lead, be very dangerous to societies. And then we need to tell them, be careful uh, to go down that path because this might damage your reputation and certainly might be dam damaging sort of uh, uh, the long-term survival of your company. So even if you are purely self-interest, you should have a bit, of, a bit of a longer perspective in the way you do business. Can the rule of law ever really keep up with the fast lane of the finance industry? Or does innovation and does, you know, 
the ability to hide um, just run too fast? I think it's a bit of uh, playing catch up. In uh, thieves always invent new ways to steal, and uh, policemen always invent new way to catch them. And uh, I think that uh, the same issue is in every regulatory environment. And uh, in finance, uh, um, is uh, the, the world is probably faster than in the world of uh, um, sort of uh, regular uh, guards and thieves. So. Uh, I think that uh, we need to uh, help uh, the regulators do their job properly. And this is one of the role of the academia is precisely to expose what it works and what it doesn't and what yeah. kind of regulation should be introduced and what kind of regulation is useless or sometimes harmless. Professor Zingales, thank you very much. My pleasure. And that's our program for today. We're here with a new show each week at this hour. And do tune into my radio program. It's weekday mornings at 10 on WNYC 93.9 FM and AM 820. I'm Brian Lehrer. Thanks for watching.